Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. This morning, I come to minister to you from the title, Rise Up to New Life. The reason I believe we can all rise to new life and that it's possible is because God has already done so much for us and brought us through so much. Think about it all the things that God has brought us through and all the things the Lord has done, all the ways that God has helped us overcome and to endure and to rise above situation and situation and situation. So I'm convinced this morning, and I say hallelujah to the Lord, that because of all the Lord has done, we can make it through it all. Someone say amen with me. And I don't know about you, but right now, I'm looking forward to see what's next, because I believe that where we are is not where we're supposed to stop. I believe that there is more for us to accomplish and more for us to do. And so I know that with God, all things are possible. So will you pray with me? Let us pray. Oh, Lord and our God, we love you. We bless you. We trust you. We thank you for all the ways that you have helped us to depend upon your word and you've brought us through. As we gather right now, oh God, we wanna say thank you for being faithful and thank you for allowing us and staying with us and being with us. Thank you for reminding us in this moment and every time we come to you that we can rise above it all. So now Lord, I just ask that the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable to you for you are continually our rock our strength, and our Redeemer. The children of God said, amen. I wonder, beloved, do you know the poem by the late Dr. Maya Angelou called Still I Rise? If you don't, you should read it, for it is an empowering poem that speaks about the struggle to overcome prejudice and injustice. And when it is read by victims of wrongdoing, this poem becomes an anthem, a beacon of hope for those who are oppressed and downtrodden. It is also a reminder of the abuses of power by those who sit in government, the judiciary, the military, and the police force. And for anyone who is in need, it is a clear, repeated message of hope that no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the situations may be, one can say with God-given confidence, I rise, I rise, I rise. I rise, I rise, I rise, I believe, may be and can be a mantra for any of us and to anyone that has a need for such a time as this. Oh, what a time this is, isn't it? Think about and chat if you would like. The great things that are happening in your life and world right now. Go ahead, take a moment, I'll wait. Now, I want you also to think and chat about, about the foolish and the horrible things occurring in your life and in the world. And once again, I will wait. I did say chat and say with me, if you want, and you believe that this could be your mantra. I rise, I rise, I rise. I rise in the name of God, the creator. I rise in the name of Jesus, our redeemer. I rise in the name of the sweet Holy Spirit that sustains us. I rise, I rise, I rise. The late John Lewis, who I adored and loved to listen to, would remind us and say, we may not have chosen the time but the time has now chosen us. And in hearing his words, I can't help but not hear the conversation between Mordecai and Queen Esther that says, and who knows but that you have come for such a time as this. So in this time, when we intentionally celebrate Black history, you know the wonderful accomplishments and the gifting and the challenges that we once had to overcome and that we still face the opportunities and the possibilities that are still ahead for people who look like me. We come this seventh Sunday of Epiphany where we also continually stay aware to the revelation and the manifestation of the hidden possibilities gifted to us by our risen savior. 
And so with all of this in mind and the call in our soul to rise to new life, I want to share with you a little bit about the letter that Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. You see, Paul is writing to a very successful church. They had grown in number and they had grown in spiritual gifts. And despite all their growth, they were divided and splitting over the, their favorite preacher, sexual immorality, doctrine and legislation, the Lord's Supper, the spiritual gifts, especially if you could speak in tongues and all that other good stuff. And yet in all of this growth that they had going on and the success, the thing that divided them the most, and you wouldn't believe it, but it was the thing that our passage is all about this day. They were arguing about the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how that belief undergirds the belief of who we are as the body of Christ. They were fussing and arguing about that the resurrection of the dead, especially those that believe. Now, you may say, now that's strange because every believer should know that the reason that the resurrection is real, but for them, they were influenced by the Greek philosophy of their time. The Greek philosophy of their time taught that the greatest existence of the eternal soul, that part that goes back to God, it occurs when the body is dead and the body was no longer incarcerated, that the soul would be liberated and free. And so this philosophy rejected the resurrection for it would mean that the soul in their thinking and their understanding would have to be reincarcerated by the body that they had, this human body. To which Paul said, no, no, no. If you think that that's foolish, he says, it's foolish, it's foolish. What's amazing to me in this time and world that we live that there are a number of world philosophies that still pushes down, overrides, and discount certain Christian and biblical truths. I wonder how is it in this time and this season, we still have to fight to say Black lives matter, all lives matter, when God clearly states that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. How is it that oppression in any forms are wrong, such as police brutality and the Russia and the Ukraine fight that's on the border beginning to happen soon when the Lord says, look to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice. And how is it that lies, whether they're white or not, considered not so wrong depending on their color? When the proverb tells us that truthful lips endures forever, but lying tongue is but for a moment. And that no human being is illegal regardless of how they come to the U.S., the United States of America. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God that they know regardless of how we treat them and where they put where we may put them as a society, the Lord believes and the Lord declares that the Lord is near to all who call on him and to all who call on him in truth. And so in this time and season, when we are fussing about philosophies and how some even argue about Jesus, I pray that we, the body of Christ, know that Jesus is real and that Jesus Christ lives and he is our risen savior who, when we say that Christ has died and Christ is risen and Christ will come again, and because of this, we will rise. I pray we believe this. And so Paul, to help those back then, to help themselves, he had to show and to reveal to them the truth about the resurrection and the truth about the resurrection power that resides in all who believe. He needed to tell them and us now to know that the resurrection is what makes all the difference in every believer's life. And Paul actually began teaching this truth earlier in chapter 15, when he in essence said, look, if the dead in Christ are not raised, then Jesus Christ did not raise. And if Jesus is still dead, then you and I in essence are screwed. For the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most critical thing in our lives as believers. And I pray you believe this, don't you? I tell you, it's vital for you to know this and believe this for if you want to rise and for us to keep rising, it's, it's so, so necessary that you understand 
that the only way that you can keep rising to new life, if you believe that the resurrection power is moving in you and that Jesus rose from the dead. So using some lessons from nature, he taught some spiritual principles. And like Paul, I am a firm believer that if you have the principle, regardless of what the situation is, regardless of the circumstance, if you know the principle, you'll have the understanding and to be able to grow and have the power to overcome whatever you're going through. And so I want you to receive and claim these God-given principles for you this day. Amen? So the principles that I want you to get this day, I believe are the principles we all need to keep rising to new life. I also believe they are the principles for our church to rise to new life. I believe it's the principles that we need as a community to help raise all to new life. And so I pray that you are with me, amen. So here are these principles. And these principles I want you to understand, they hold the spiritual truths for living day by day here on this earth. But more importantly, they give us that unshakable promise that when our time comes, we will rise to the highest heights. The principles are such. The first is that God is the one acting and God is the one that chooses the body that we all inhabit. The scripture clearly says God gives it, meaning the seed, the body as God has chosen and to each the seed their own body. Now, this is significant to understand when we are talking about the things and the things that we are encountering in this world. If God is the one that gives the body and God has chosen how the body should look, then that should mean that everyone in our world, especially those that are black and brown, who are constantly pressed down and discounted by people, systems, and anything else that rises up against us, that says that our lives don't matter and that our bodies are ugly, they are wrong. And this is important for those to understand that in our denomination, when we're splitting over the fact of those who are created in God's image, and because we can't believe that all are part of the beloved body of Christ, that too lets them know this principle says they are wrong because God has chosen everybody. And it is vital for when there are cliques and groups and bullying and judging and all those things that discount the uniqueness of who we are as an individual and who God has created us to be. It is wrong. We do not choose the body we have. God chooses the body. We are created as God has created us to be. And I, for example, can't help but the fact that I am a wonderful, beautiful, Black, Afro-American, Chris, Hispanic woman who happens to be a female pastor. And I can't help it that God has in this body chosen to make me a female pastor in a predominantly male profession and made me pastor in a predominantly white denomination. Can't help it. That's the body God gave. What body did God give you? Where did God put you? It's where you belong. And because this is the body that God gave us, we are called to care for the body. We're called to love the body. We're called to treasure the body. And I'm not just talking about our individual bodies, but I'm talking about the body of Christ. We belong to God. The one who raised us and created us in our mama's wombs and from that time raised us and will take care of us until we rise to eternal life with him. He says, God says, Jesus declares, all bodies, no matter what their lives, black lives, all lives matter, amen. And it's time for us to believe and rise up and rise against any philosophy, any system, any notion, any word, any deed, anything that speaks otherwise to this. Hallelujah, amen. The second principle comes from nature. And the heavens, they teach us about this resurrection life, that unless it dies, meaning the seed or the flesh or whatever it is that's not of God, unless it dies, there is no enduring life. Mm. Think about that for a moment. Think about that because as I teach this next section, I want to ask you what needs to die? 
We all know that living plants come out of the death of a seed, yes? It must go into the ground. It must destroy itself, get nurtured and rise again. We know that in order, unless it dies and does its transformation, new life can't happen. We also know that new life can only come from that which is dead and that new life can always arise out of something that's dead. The scripture says, very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So think about it, beloved. Where do you want much fruit and what needs to die in this season? You should also take note under this principle that death is not just of our bodies. It's of the ways that we act that's against God. It's those things that are unjust, those things that are evil. It is also, I must tell you, when things die, that in the nature and, and in life, death is not an obstacle to resurrection, hallelujah. That in fact, it's essential for the resurrection. Knowing this, I wonder why are we afraid to let things die? What is it that we need to let die in our lives in this season? I want to assure you that because Jesus showed us how it's done and because Jesus has given us and because we believe in Jesus and because our belief in Jesus, meaning that we have proclaimed that Jesus is our Lord and Savior and that we are now, we know that we are justified and that we are living by grace and sanctification and continuing to grow in him, we understand that this principle of death and life is not so bad. Amen. We also understand, we need to understand another principle, that there is unity in difference. Mm. Say, thank me to God I'm not like you and that we are different. It comes also from nature as well. Notice that when the seed goes into the ground, although it dies, what grows out of it is still similar just a different form. For example, an apple seed yields a apple, uh-huh. A pumpkin seed yields a. And notice that when whatever goes down is small, but whatever rises up is greater. I love the example. Every time I look at an acorn and I look at an oak tree, I said, oh my Lord, and that little bitty thing held the potential for life. You also should know that unity and difference also speaks to who we are collectively. We are the body of Christ. Different, yes, hallelujah, unified and alike in this way. When we walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus, act like Jesus, love like Jesus, serve like Jesus, think like Jesus, then, beloved, we are different but united. I love how this principle is important for us as our as first church, because we do say our core values are faith, service, and diversity. And I want us to begin to grow and discover what that means because I love how President, Vice President Kamala Harris has said, she says, unity is our strength and our diversity is our power, hallelujah. So thank God who knew that there needs to be unity yet difference. The other part of this principle that you should hold on to is that out of death comes a glorified body. Mm. The best way I can teach this truth is to tell you a story. My baby sister, who you don't know, her name was Tamara. She passed away in 94. But my sister passed away from a brain tumor. By the time she died on this side of glory and rose to new life, she had no hair. She was unable to walk. Many times I had to carry her on my back. And by the time she passed away, she was so weak, yet her spirit was so strong. On the day that she died, we had an uncle 
named Tio Tito. He was missing in action for five years. For five years, we had no idea where this man was, what was going on, and how he was doing. On the day my sister died, we were with her in the morning. That afternoon, my father was in the church. He wasn't in the church more than five minutes when my uncle, who was missing in action, Tio Tito, walked into his office. Mindful, my father was amazed and surprised. He was like, what are you doing here? How did you get here? He said, Tammy, my baby sister, told him to come home. He talked about how Tammy had beautiful, long hair, kinky and curly. He talked about how she was walking and had this glow and that all her limbs and that she reached out to hug him and said, it's time to go home. That is the best way I can help describe and help you understand what we may not yet know, that this body of ours, when it dies, it will grow into a glorified, hallelujah, awesome body. And so we need to hold on to the fact that every seed that dies, everything that comes to an end, ultimately in God will become something more beautiful, hallelujah. And we should know that. This truth means that we who are alive in Christ have the same power to help these things come to pass, that we have the power to help destroy systems and create new systems that will bring beauty and glory to God, that we can do anything in Christ because he strengthens us. And we need to understand that this body, this life that we hold. Another principle is ultimately that it will die. And it will die because it's made to live in this world. And our life on this world is just for a season. The systems and the powers and the things that we create in humanity, be it guns, be it laws, whatever it is that we create, buildings, churches, things, they are made by hands for this world and they eventually come down to ruin. And every time they come down, every time they fall, something better rises up. First church, we can look at our age. We are, I believe, going to be 170 years old. And Lord knows we don't look like what we used to, thanks be to God. And God is not done with us yet. God, I believe, is putting us through a process of transformation, glory to God. And so in this season, we're called to sow. Because this stuff that dies, know that it's considered dishonorable. It's weak, it's mortal, and it will rise to new life one day, hallelujah. I share this principle because I believe that this last two years in COVID has been a process of death. I share this with you because we are celebrating Black history and for over 400 years, we as a people of color have been trying to fight down and bring down the systems that bring death. And I'm convinced that even though sometimes death looks like it's barren, I believe, I believe, I believe that new life comes. It's amazing in this time and season that we are in the season of winter. We know what happens in winter, yes? At the end of every winter comes spring, a refreshment, a relief, a renewal. And I believe that as we come out of this season of death, as we come out of this season of mourning, as we rise up as a people of God and a people of color, I believe that refreshment is coming. I believe new life is coming. I believe that it's only possible because Jesus himself did it and showed us the way. I believe that Jesus came to this world and took on mortal flesh and showed us how to live. I believe that he died and when he died, he rose again. And I believe that in his rising again because he was the second Adam. The first Adam is like us. 
who was dead. Because you know when we die, we become nothing but dust. But because of Jesus, who was the second Adam that came in flesh, when he came in flesh and he died and he rose again, he gave us life-giving power to rise with him again and again and again and again. And because he rose and has gone to glory, he will come again, glory to God. And when he comes again, we shall be like him. But we have the power to be like him now. And so when the gospel calls us to love and to give and to serve, and to be in ways that so counteract the philosophy of this world. I want you to know that every time we do it, we mimic new life. Every time we do it, we rise someone, we raise someone else to new life. Every time we do it, we allow resurrection power to do it. And so I believe in the season, it's time for us to rise to new life. And what ultimately reminds me of this truth, and I'm grateful not only for past experiences that God has brought us through, but I'm reminded of an essential truth. Every night we close our eyes. It's like a small death. And every morning we open our eyes, we arise with new mercies. And those new mercies allow us to live the life that God has called us to live by the grace of God. And so as long as the Lord allows you to fall asleep and rise again on this side of glory with new mercies. I pray that you use the resurrection power that is in you to make sure that you continue to rise to new life and give others life and see what God will do and how God will get all glory. Because when God gets all the glory, we see wonderful things. When God gets all the glory, we see how God manifests God's goodness in the land of the living. When we see God, do, when we see God's glory, we know that we can rise. We can rise. Hallelujah. We can rise. And that's my prayer for us in this season, in this time, in this world. Amen.